from its takeoff to the mysteries behind it and more. Join me as we explore the vanishing of Flight 370 and its mystery. This particular flight was en route to Beijing, China and was going over the Indian Ocean when it suddenly and inexplicably altered course from its targeted path. Not long after, it vanished from all radars with no word or reason as to why. The plane had 239 passengers on it, plus the crew. Springing into action, a search for the missing plane began based on the last known coordinates of the craft. But no matter how far they searched, whether it was above the water or below, they couldn't find anything. It was the most costly search in aviation history. This was mainly because the information about the plane and its whereabouts couldn't be fully trusted, so the search parameters continued to grow. Despite multiple searches and debris of the ship washing up on shores of various nearby land masses, the plane itself in its entirety, or fragments, have not been found. Even with the searches going well into 2018, the disappearance of Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 remains a major mystery in aviation. But let's dive deeper into this, shall we? Let's look into what really happened and all the true mysteries that continue to surround it. One of the biggest things that needs to be noted about Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 is that this was a very basic and routine flight, one that had been done many times before. It was a night flight and was set to take passengers from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing, China. The flight on average would have taken around six hours. And yet, as we obviously noted, it didn't land there. And to this day in 2020, we still don't know where the plane is, what exactly happened to it, and more. There is so little information that it's become one of the greatest mysteries in history, and especially in the last 10 years. What happened to Flight 370? And just as important, how could something like this happen in the technologically advanced age that we live in right now? The flight, as noted, was a routine flight, no matter what way you choose to look at it. In fact, Malaysia Airlines ran this particular flight twice a day, which means that the people flying these craft were not only certified, they knew what to expect and would have known if something was very wrong. The plane itself was a Boeing 777 and was a very competent craft. It had 11 years of experience, and this was the craft that made the trips to Beijing and back on the regular. There had been no previous incidents with the craft at all, and it had no history of issues. In short, this was a craft and airline that knew how to take care of its planes, and thus something like this happening to them is beyond odd. In terms of fuel, the craft had nearly eight hours worth of fuel for a flight that wouldn't even take six. While this may seem like overkill, the intention was that should something go wrong, they could make a key diversion and go to whatever landmass was closest to them in order to land and obviously protect all the people on board. But again, that didn't happen. Could it have been the fault of the crew? That's very unlikely. The crew of Flight 370 was all Malaysian and veterans of their positions. Just in terms of the pilot, he had been a part of Malaysia Airlines since the 1980s and had over 18,000 logged flight time in the air, making him not just a veteran, but one of the most experienced pilots you're likely to find. Even if something had gone wrong with him, his co-pilot was experienced as well. He had been with the airline for seven years and had over 2,000 hours of flight time on his own. So combined, these two had decades of experience and over 25,000 hours of flight experience. Now, let's head to the flight and break it down step by step for a while. The flight itself was a bit late to take off. Instead of its usual time, it had a slight delay that made it launch at 12.42 a.m. As was standard procedure, after the liftoff, the plane went and got confirmation from air traffic control to climb to 18,000 feet. It's also important to note that at this point in time, both pilot and the co-pilot had radioed in and talked with air traffic control to prove that everything was going okay. And for the first bit of the flight, that sense of being okay was maintained, which was to be expected as again, this was a very basic flight. Then, at 1.06 a.m., things started to go wrong, but not in the overt way. When planes like these take off, they have systems that alert radar towers and air traffic control to where they are, that way they can be warned if a plane is getting too close to them or there's something else going on that could interfere with their flight. But at 1.06 a.m., Flight 370 sent its final automated positioning signal, and no communications with the plane came after that except for a standard communication by the pilot and radar team. 
The radar team from Malaysia signaled the craft and told them to switch to Vietnam airspace for all further communications. After wishing the craft good night, the pilot said good night in return, and that was the last anyone heard from them. At 1.21 a.m., the sequence of events started to get a lot weirder. Mainly, they disappeared from the sight of both Malaysian and Vietnam radars. The only way this could happen is if they were blocked by clouds or something was wrong with the transponder. That night, there were no issues with the weather. It was impossible for clouds to cause interference because there wasn't enough in the area of Flight 370 and there were no storms either, which means that something happened to the transponder. And yet, the transponder had been checked before the flight for safety reasons, which leaves the only logical explanation – someone turned the transponder off. But why someone would do something like that is as big a mystery as what happened to the flight itself. While the standard radars of the airports in Malaysia and Vietnam couldn't track the plane, the plane wasn't fully lost. Instead, the plane was picked up by nearby military radar. Through this radar, we got the next steps in the flight and the mystery only built from it. The plane at first took a right turn, but then basically did a U-turn and started to head back towards Malaysia and even crossed Penang a little while later. Then, after doing this, it took another right turn and started to cross the Strait of Malacca. The plane continued on this trajectory until 2.22 a.m. when it was definitively above the Indian Ocean. At this point, it was at the limits of the military radar that had been tracking it for a while. But the plane itself was still making communications with satellites in space, and those satellites were able to provide information that stated that Flight 370 took another turn and headed out even more over the Indian Ocean and flew for about five hours in that direction. During certain points of this flight, the cockpit was called multiple times, and yet the cockpit didn't answer. There was no response at all, no matter how many times it was called. Then, after 7.30 a.m., the plane was one hour late from its scheduled arrival in Beijing. This forced the Malaysian government to admit that they had lost the flight and had sent out search and rescue missions to try and find the plane. Before we dive more into this mysterious incident, be sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel. That way, you don't miss any of our weekly videos. As time ticked on, the plane continued to send signals to satellites and the companies attached to them. But then, by 9.15, the signal from satellite went unanswered. As to why it didn't, there's a very basic explanation for that. By this point in time, the plane would have been dangerously low on fuel. Don't forget, it was meant to have fuel that lasted a bit under 8 hours for a less than 6-hour trip. But given everything that had been going on, the plane had been in the air for over 8 hours, more or less. While we don't know the exact time the plane crashed, we do know based on the satellite signals that the plane went down somewhere over the Indian Ocean between 8.19 and 9.15 a.m. Another big mystery was where the plane itself crashed, because it was way off course in all the ways that mattered, and the only thing tracking it for its final 5-hour stretch was that of the satellite. And based on the projections and data, the plane likely crashed somewhere in the Indian Ocean west of Australia. Yes, they had flown so far that they were west of the Australian continent. They weren't heading for it, though, just to be clear. What were they heading for? We have no idea. There were no islands near their new course, and the continent that they only could have headed for in that path was Antarctica. But why a random Malaysia flight would want to head that far south is beyond those who have studied this incident. The rescue attempts to find the plane and its passengers were long and numerous. We're talking almost a month solid of searching. It started in Southeast Asia because of early guesses about the plane's whereabouts. But because of the satellite data, we were able to guide the rescue attempts to the Indian Ocean. Multiple governments came together for a massive search party that included 17 ships and 345 sorties trying to find Flight 370. In total, they searched an area of 4.6 million square kilometers. That's bigger than India, and yet, despite all of those people and craft looking, including all the technology they had to bear, they found absolutely nothing. This including a massive sonar search of the area believed to be where the plane crashed, but it too brought up nothing. During the initial search, nothing was found, but clues were eventually found a year later. In July of 2015, a piece of wreckage from the plane was found on the beaches of Reunion. Where is that? That's 4,000 kilometers west of where everyone was searching. And that island isn't near Australia, it was near Africa. What was the piece itself? It was a wing flapperon, and it was one that was confirmed to be from Flight 370. 
This particular piece offered potential clues as to what happened, including the fact that based on the damage to the flap, the piece wasn't extended when it crashed into the water, meaning that instead of doing a safe crash landing like pilots are trained to do in situations over the water, they instead did a vertical dive into the water for reasons very much unknown. A few more pieces of the plane were also discovered in Africa, but no other major parts were found, and by January 17, 2017, three years after the plane's official disappearance, the official search for the plane was called off by the various governments as they had no idea where else to look for it. Unless you think they gave up too easily, three governments helped lead the search for this singular aircraft, and all told, they spent $155 million on it. That makes this the most expensive rescue mission in aviation history, and it all ended without finding the ship. At best, they felt they could narrow down the area that they felt the plane crashed into. With that knowledge, a private group from the United States took up the search and look in that general area and beyond. Yet a few months after searching the area, they found nothing. Which brings us to what happened on that plane that could have caused this. Obviously, someone was flying the plane, but was it the pilots assigned to the craft or someone else? Hijacking stories and theories were one of the most popular after the plane disappeared, and one story about stolen passports led to the belief that two Iranians hijacked the plane for unknown reasons. However, while the stolen passports by the Iranians were confirmed, they were also confirmed to be asylum seekers heading to Beijing for rescue. Other hijacking stories stated that the plane was headed to the Indian Ocean because of a plan to land it on a certain island, but no terror groups have ever taken credit for this, which would seem to point to either one of the other passengers taking over the plane or the crew taking over. But despite extensive research into both the crew and the passengers, there has been no evidence that states that they had any involvement in what happened to Malaysia Airlines Flight 370. In fact, there is no sign of foul play outside of the weird flight path of the plane and the transponder to the plane being turned off. The lack of evidence has led to some out there theories as to what happened, including black holes, aliens, fires causing decompression sickness, and more. But all of these stories and more have holes in them that can't be explained. And because of that, the mystery of Flight 370 continues. Thanks for watching, everyone! What did you think of this breakdown of the events that led to the disappearance of Malaysia Airlines Flight 370? Can you believe that an event like this happened in modern times? What do you think is the reason that we can't find this plane? Let me know in the comments below, be sure to subscribe, and I'll see you next time on the channel.